Got some paint shot onto the spindles and the brake brackets. Um, not particularly my favorite color, but it was just trying to use up some paint that I had laying around. And I'd rather put a little color on stuff and make everything solid black. It'll all be under the car anyway. But at least this way, it's the color that's not black, so I can more likely see if something's leaking or like a fluid or whatever. Well, these spindles already got their seals on them from part one. So I'm gonna put the brackets on the spindles. We got the hubs to get studs pressed into and new bearing races because we're gonna switch everything over to Timken and SKF bearings instead of whatever stuff happened to arrive in the hubs themselves just for quality control at that point. So assembling these is pretty straightforward. Just got a left and a right brake bracket. The spindles are exactly the same, doesn't matter which one they go on. So all we gotta do is bolt them together. Now one reason uh, I should explain is this is just uh, spray paint versus like doing a powder coat. Um, I have done powder coat before, but if you do that, you need to clean off the sur meeting surfaces because that powder coat can kind of build up and it just makes the alignment off a little bit or it can cause the bolts to come loose. So I've done that in the past. I also did the same thing where it meets up with the caliper so the caliper mounts to the back side so here so I just clean off where the ears of the caliper would be at. And that's just to make sure that uh, we minimize anything coming loose. We got left and right. Press the new races into the hubs. Uh, one thing to do is uh, usually if you weld on the old races to take them out, it'll shrink them down and then they're small enough there that they can be easily removed. They won't get stuck in the press fit and you can use them as a spacer when you press the new ones in. I had to fight with these a little bit there because it kept wanting to tip sideways a little bit. I mean, otherwise there's plenty of tools for just driving them straight in. Using the ARP extended washers, this part number is 100-7725. These are a little over half an inch longer than stock. Actually, I have a stud. So here's the stock ones that came out. So actually it's probably three quarters of an inch longer. And what I like about them is they have that bullet nose. So the big thing is just I like the extra length there for using a uh, taller wheel nut just for more thread engagement to make sure that the wheel's staying on for the racing stuff. So we'll get these pressed in to both hubs and then we'll be ready to put them on the spindles. Now instead of going ham on these things with a hammer just trying to pound them in or using a uh, nut to draw them in with a few washers. I like to use, take a socket. These are 12 millimeters, so they're a little under half, so you can use any half inch dry socket. I'm just using this inch and a quarter because it's nice and big. And then we can push on them with the press and push them in real nice. It'll be a lot less uh, fuss and screwing around than any other method. Um, obviously I've done the drawing in with a nut before it just usually you got to have a couple of spare nuts because at some point you're going to strip it out unless you have a nut that's got a lot more thread just a typical regular nut usually isn't enough thread to last for pulling a full set in
Now we need a pack of wheel bearings for the inner before we put the seal on. They almost would pass through, but probably gonna end up damaging the seal if we do that. The seals we're using are, because it's a G-Body hub, we're using a G-Body seal, which is an 8871 National. The inner bearing for both the G-Body and the AFX spindle is a set six from Timken. And we'll just use our bearing packer here to speed up the process. All right, for seal insulation, we don't need to get too fancy. Simple block of wood. And a nice square hit. Nothing to it. All right, before I go putting these on, I'm gonna pack this open groove back here underneath the seal and between the seal and the bearing basically with some extra grease just to make sure that there's a good supply there. As I put them on, I'm also gonna put a big old glob inside of the hub here just because as the hub gets warm, it'll liquefy that grease and then it's gonna make sure that the bearings are getting lubrication. The outer bearing, being as we're using these AFX spindles, is going to be a Timken Set 2. These particular ones are an SKF, but it's a, a Set 2 is what you're going to be looking for. And then the threads on the end are different than what the G-Body are going to be, so you need to get a different spindle, nut, and washer. These two I got from Speedway Motors, the numbers uh, 910-6160. And it fits, it comes with the uh, cotter pins, the washer and the nut. Works great for this. So I'm gonna get these put together. The other part of making sure you pack some grease in there is that you're actually smearing the grease on the seal itself so that you're not putting the seal on dry. And as the final, just a little bit more grease, I'm just going to take a grease gun and kind of pump in a layer here before putting the washer on. As far as I'm concerned, there's not a uh, too much grease situation. Oh, we can put our washer on. And then the nut. So, setting these bearings up before I put the cotter pins in. Typically, I'd want to do this on the car so that I can feel more of the tension and you know have everything be stable instead of it being loose here on the bench, but we're gonna just go with it. So I'm kind of just gonna tighten it up a little bit at a time and just check the drag. seeing when it finally gets too tight to have a significant increase in drag. I do want to set it up a little bit on the tight side just because it's going to naturally loosen up especially after the car starts auto crossing and hitting the track. So there I noticed a little bit of more drag increase. Now this is a lot easier with like a wheel on it a bigger diameter. Yeah, now I got quite a bit more drag. So I'm going to look at where I mean, I'm kind of in the middle of this castle nut here. I'll get you zoomed in so you can see. So my hole is right in the middle of this castle nut. So I can either keep going tighter to get to this one or I got to back it off to that one. 
Athena's already got quite a bit of tension that I'm noticing. I'm going to back it off to that one. I think that's going to be pretty good. I still feel just a little bit of drag on there. Like I said, I know it's going to get looser. Typically, I'll end up uh, setting them up, and then after a few events, I check them again, especially if I think something weird is going on. I mean, I've had weird, you know, they've got, you can get a little bit of play out of them, and nothing's actually failed, so you don't have to be super worried about it, but you want to make sure that they're not sloppy to the point where all of a sudden you're banging back and forth and now you're loading that bearing very weird. And then there's situations like this where I'm lined up pretty good with the hole right now, but it's stiffer than I want it to be, a lot more drag. So I'm going to see if I can back it up just a little past the hole just a little bit is what I did. So now I'm gonna back it up just a little and see if that's gonna free it up enough. It's still got more drag than I want, so I'd rather turn to the loose side, provided it's not too loose. We're definitely lower drag than that one. And like I said, you know, the stuff will tend to loosen up, but I'd rather start a little bit under ideal than too high, just because it will cause additional heat buildup if the drag is too high. And this is going to be something where I wouldn't be surprised with after these wear in a little bit and kind of get settled and seated out if perhaps this one is just fine and this one might need to be tightened up to that next notch. Now we're on to the steering arms. Because I have swapped to a rack and pinion in my car, it only has uh, two and a half inches of travel per one revolution of the steering wheel versus a uh, fast ratio box on the G body is around three inches. But by going to the smaller travel steering rack, I use a pinto arm for these three piece and that actually at a quarter turn of the steering wheel gives me around a degree and a half or two degrees more steering angle. So it's actually even quicker than the fast ratio 12 to 1 box is. And when I did that swap I was able to shave like 45 pounds off the nose of the car going to the rack and pinion over the steering box and all that linkage. This isn't a straight swap though. We got to modify these arms a little bit and I'll show you what that entails. So with these AFX spindles, uh, Speedway made it a common spacing. So I assume that any of the AFX steering arms would have the same spacing. They have the dimensions on their website so you could verify if you have a different steering arm than the Speedway arm. I'm guessing that this is going to be a fairly common measurement so just about any aftermarket steering arm out there is probably going to fit. This would be the driver's side of the car. So we're talking the left. These arms are lefts and rights. But these arms are built for the G-body spindle with the G-body stock brake bracket. So there's this gap here. Now we could just make a spacer to run that. However, as you can see these lefts and rights, they're tilted to actually move the steering arm outboard versus if you look at your stock G-body spindle, they're moved inboard. 
quite a bit. By moving this L board, we're actually gaining more Ackerman. And to maximize that, I'm going to cut this boss down here. It'll end up being notched in a little bit, but it'll gain me another, I think it's 300 thou, so a little over a quarter inch, almost 5 sixteenths of an inch, more distance for the tie rod to be moved out for a little extra Ackerman. An Ackerman is the inside wheel turning sharper than the outside wheel so that your tires are actually rolling on the correct radius. Now whether that's going to be worth the effort for you to machine these down or just make a spacer, I don't know. It might not even be worth the effort for me. It's just, I mean, I'm trying to maximize what I can here. So uh, I've already checked there. I can actually uh, grab a hold of this part here and run this in the lathe and be able to cut it down. So that should work out uh, really nice for me. Otherwise, it would. I've typically what I've done before is you can just uh, you know clamp this down in the mill and mill that off is what I've done before. But I don't have a mill access here right now, so just going to be doing what I can to make it work. So if you want to know what the difference that just the Pinto arm would make over the stock G body arm at a half turn of the steering wheel, so you know taking the top and putting it to the bottom, you know that would be. 12.84 degrees on a stock G body arm, but it'd be 17.46 with the Pinto arm. And this is the arc that you can see. I mean, that's the difference in length. Here's the pivot point. So there's the Pinto arm length and the stock G body arm length. So it makes quite a bit of difference. And if you were deciding to try to take one of these cars drifting or something and it's about getting an angle, this would be a real easy way to do it where you're going to go from a max, you know, at lock angle of 33.75 degrees to 48.59. That's probably still not as much as you want, but like I said, we're talking the stock 12 to 1 steering box is 3 inches a revolution. You can get faster ratio boxes that are even down to, I think, 1.8, which is getting to be kind of a popular box. Or if you do what I do and you go to a rack and pinion, you can get 3.5 or 4 inch or even 4.5 inch revolution racks, which are pretty damn fast. And then it's just a matter of how much clearance you got between the wheel and all the suspension components about how much angle you can get out of it. So this is the setup I got. Arms clamped. We already started to cut. We're just going to be feeding this boring bar out. Kind of. Here we have the modified versus the unmodified. You can see we just took away the material on the side that we needed. So that, it will sit flat against our spindle now. You should also note that on the, the G-body specific spindle, or the metric chassis one from Speedway, um, these AFX ones have more clearance. I had to grind a little bit up on this horseshoe shape here to get it to clear on the ones that are currently on the car and have been on the car for over two years now. Um, you know, so taking a little material and I mean, same thing. I did it with an ML last time, so I had more of a tight radius there rather than blending this out, but never had an issue with any of it, so. These things are plenty strong. I mean, they are circle track parts that are meant to be banging wheels and fenders all the time. So, they hold up for that. They should be just fine for doing a non-contact activity also. But, now I'll get the other one cut up and then we can probably put some paint on these and get them bolted up to spindles.
As we move on to rebuilding the calipers, uh, mostly it's just replacing the cleaning up the pistons and replacing the seals. Um, I find the easiest way to disassemble them is just put a little air pressure to it. Have something in there to make sure they don't just go flying out. You can see we got some to move. And there we got all four to move a little bit. Can progressively make this a little looser until they all pop out or at least get to where we can move them easily. It's the stiffness, like when I put that air pressure in there and the one piston didn't move, that's what we're trying to fix. Here we just need to replace the seals and clean everything up. And in some cases where it's being extra stubborn, you just keep changing uh, shim thicknesses until you can hold the ones that are loose in just far enough to create enough air pressure to push out the stubborn one. Just like that. Now with these out, these pistons are actually pretty clean. You can see they got a little bit of wear marks and dirt and stuff on them. So we'll scotch bright that just to clean them up. Um, the seals are very, very dry in here, which is no surprise. And there's a little bit of corrosion going on in there. So same thing, we'll scotch bright out the bores. Um, all right, second caliper still had a little brake fluid in it. So the, several of the pistons moved a little easier, but one still put up a fight. Now we just, Pick the seals out with a pick. If your caliper has some seals that are still in good condition, you could always uh, hang on to a few of them in case you need to do like a track side repair or even <laughs> on the side of the road or something. Because after all, these things don't have. Uh, dust shields in them. I have had to, if using an aggressive compound pad that's really corrosive, usually I uh, change these mid-season. Otherwise, uh, last year I was running the Hawk uh, ER1 and I didn't have to change them at all, but I was also using the car quite a bit more. So it varies depending on uh, usage and compound of pad, otherwise they just uh, they'll end up wearing a little weird. Um, you know, you see there's some taper in these two kind of thing. Otherwise, this one was really square still, uh, and these are just what showed up in the here. So, it's just how it works out sometimes. But again, you know, these are uh, pretty cheap to. <laughs> rebuild here because but I got a seal kit so I'm going to clean this up with some scotch bright probably scrub the whole housing clean out the lines all that in my uh, wash tank and then we'll just lube it up and reassemble it and calipers are good as new Well, I decided to take them all the way apart just to see how they look and it'll be a lot easier for some of this heavier corrosion. Um, apparently you can still take it apart even if you can't get one of the lines loose. Got that thing kind of tucked in there. Kind of a pain in the butt to get a wrench on it, but it was starting to strip out, but it'll be fine. I know I can put it back together because I got it apart. So now it'll be a little easier to get down into some of this corrosion in here, which you can you can see, uh, like it's some, it's just built up on top. It's like a chalky white stuff. So we'll be able to again just scotch braid it a bit and start taking some of that out of there. I don't know. Speed the process up. I might uh, just kind of stuff it in here and do something with the drill to be able to 
do it a little quicker. As you can see, you can get the bore shined up pretty good. I mean, that was just taking that uh, little sandpaper roll, but not using the sandpaper and just kind of burying it in like that and giving it a go for a couple seconds. But some of the lower parts are hard to get, like down there. You don't want to pass those up. Um, I've just found, you know, these are new to me. And typically once I get them cleaned out for the first time, they're the buildup that I'm trying to take out here by working in that lower area is getting it cleaned up. And mostly these things have just been uh, neglected. So once I've been using them, I typically don't have to get this involved anymore. And then when I, uh, just when a seal starts leaking, I'll just replace the seals. And usually the exposed bits on the pistons will get kind of crudded up. So you need to clean those before you put new pads on or try to push them back in at all. Or you will damage the seal and it'll leak. But you take the extra time to do it now since they're the first time you've got them. And e maintenance will be a whole lot easier in the future. There right, you got everything cleaned up. Got my new seals, just going to use a little bit of brake fluid to lubricate the seals, get them all put in place, push pistons in, and I'm just going to bottom them out, push them all the way in, and then reassemble the calipers and get all the bolts put together and stuff. I typically use some either blue Loctite or anti-seize just due to steel versus aluminum. Uh, I've really never had a problem with the caliper bolts coming loose at all. I mean, they got lock washers and stuff, but usually with the aluminum, like they crush in. And I don't. I've never had one come loose. And from the looks of it, there isn't. Uh, I don't know. There might be a little bit of sealer or something they put on there. So I just figure it's better than nothing, and then having them corrode together, and then you'll never get them apart, which sounds like a pain in the butt. So well, let's put something on there just to keep it from permanently locking itself in place. All right, they're all cleaned up. Reassemble a lot better. We'll throw some uh, fresh hockey R1s in them. prepped and ready to go with the brakes rebuilt and all the parts. Uh, now I just need to get the car in here and actually get these things mounted on the car. I still need to check about whether or not the upper control arm mounting pads going to need some modifications for the bigger ball joint. Uh, I know the lowers going to need modification or uh, there's a good chance I might just build all new lower control arms anyway, and then I'll have uh, both sets of front suspension. But, uh, yeah, maybe a couple weeks before I get to that. And this is part two of the spindle swap. And part three, we'll be getting to the install on the car and hopefully doing some testing. And testing should take place at uh, Black River Motorsports Park. We got new apparel. Check it out. Got my car on it for this year. Um, you can go over and check out Greenlight Filming for Brian's stuff on the revitalization of the track and a schedule for this year for autocross, which uh, will be getting started here in the next month or so.